Again, happy Sabbath. Say happy Sabbath to everyone here, and happy Sabbath to everyone that's watching this via live stream. And um, we're here together for no normal occasion. I truly do believe that what we're all gathered here together for at this time is a very historic occasion, a very momentous event. Things that we heard of for years, and I speak directly to those of us that are professed Sabbath keepers, those that have been a part of this great Advent movement for quite a bit of time. Things that we heard ministers and pastors in the days of old speak of from the pulpit. But now that message has certainly died away. Yet nonetheless, these truths are now coming to fruition. We are seeing history fulfilled right before our faces. We are seeing the unraveling of Bible prophecy. And as the servants of the living God in this hour, we cannot be silent. Neither can we be uncertain as to where we stand in our relationship with Jesus Christ. Right now, men are seeking to rewrite sacred history. And this is going to have dire implications for those who know not the truth. And I pray that we can talk a little bit about this this evening. But it's going to be my aim at this time not to talk about something new, so to say. I believe that God's people have been leaving that straight and narrow path of truth because we've been looking after, or looking for rather, new things. New things to tickle our ears, new things to excite our intellects, but we're finding that we're moving away from the sacred, sacred old paths of truth. And God has told us in the book of 2 Peter chapter 1 and verse 12, Wherefore I will not be negligent to put you always in remembrance of these things, though ye already know them, and be established in the present truth. It is the responsibility of the true preacher of righteousness to reiterate truths that we are supposed to be familiar with, but yet these things need to be reiterated over and over and over and over again because it is only by this means that we will be established in the present truth. And you can see, and I can see if your eyes are open, the fact that if we forget our past history, if we forget the sacred truths that God delivered to us throughout antiquity, it's surely going to be the means of our downfall in the very near future. And so before I open up the Word of God, because we're going to be looking into the Word of God, because this is the foundation of all truth, I want to invite you to have a word of prayer with me. It's my firm belief that every time the Word of God is open, that the Spirit of the Lord is at hand to lead and direct our minds into all truth. And so it's always my tradition, and I don't have too many traditions that I hold to, but this is not one that I'll surrender. I always love to encourage everyone, whether you're watching via live stream or you're here with me right now, I'm encouraging you to do two things with me. Number one, please pray for yourself. Every time the scriptures are open, the Spirit of the Lord is at hand to open up the minds of the earnest seekers of truth to know what the will of God is. If we are simply praying and asking, Lord, teach me what your desire is for my life. Open my understanding that I might know what truth is. And so if it is your desire to know the truth for this hour, and brothers and sisters, we need to know the truth for this hour. We can't any longer be satisfied with hearing, as I said earlier, fanciful messages that tickle our ears. We can't be, uh, we can't be um, content with just hearing the words that come out of the mouth of another mere mortal, we need to know what God's direction is for our lives. And so my counsel, number one to you, is to pray and ask for the Spirit of the Lord to please open up your mind and be your counselor this evening. And please pray for myself as well that I'll be an instrument that the Lord can use. I'm going to kneel to pray at this time. That's my tradition. As you're here with me, I invite you to kneel with me. As you're watching with me on live stream, I invite you to kneel with me as well. And let's pray and ask God to be with us that we might hear his voice. I want to encourage you all, just take the next few moments, 30 seconds, to pray silently in your hearts before you hear my voice and ask God 
to wash you, to cleanse you of all sin, to focus your mind, and for his presence to be here with us. When you hear my voice, I'll be closing us out in prayer. Let's just take some time in silent prayer. Father in heaven, Lord God of the universe, yet once again I come before your throne and I do so in the name of Jesus. It is our privilege and a privilege that we lightly esteem to be able to call upon the name of you, the Most High God. Not only to call you as God, but to acknowledge you and to be accepted by you as our Heavenly Father. Lord, I thank you that you're concerned with each one of us intimately as if there was not another human being on the face of planet Earth. And Lord, we need this type of communion with you. We need this intimate connection with you because it's only those we can see according to your word that know you intimately and your son Jesus Christ it is only those that have this intimacy that will be partakers of life eternal. Lord, my favorite promise in the book of Jeremiah, chapter 33 and verse 3, you said, Call unto me, and I will answer thee, and I will show thee great and mighty things which thou knowest not. Lord, I cry out to you right now, and I'm asking that you would imbue all of our minds with divine wisdom, that you would open up our understanding, not only to the events that are transpiring and that which will unfold in the future, but open up our understanding as to who we are as individuals and where we stand within the framework of the fulfillment of Bible prophecy. May your holy angels be here with us to subdue the agencies of the enemy that will seek to harass and distract our minds. Lord, moreover, I pray that they would be the ones to minister unto us this evening. Thank you for hearing this, our humble prayer. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. As I stated earlier, we know that in just a few days from now, the 31st of this month to be exact, Pope Francis will be sitting down with the leaders of the Lutheran Church right here in Sweden, or over there in Sweden. And the main purpose for this ecumenical meeting is to abridge the history of the Protestant Reformation. Brothers and sisters, ladies and gentlemen, for them to take their fingers and place it upon this sacred history is going to have serious implications for many people that are not knowledgeable of those things which transpired in the past that has brought God's people to where we are now. Now, the Bible tells us in the book of Ecclesiastes, chapter 3 and verse 15, one of my favorite Bible scriptures, it tells us there, that which hath been is now. And that which is to be hath already been, and God requireth that which is past. What has transpired in the past is taking place in our present day society. And what is going to take place in the future, at least in principle, has already taken place in the past. And God requires, therefore, of all of us, he commands us to have an accurate knowledge of historic events, especially those that have impacted his people throughout antiquity so that we can better comprehend what is going on right now in our world and what we can expect to transpire in the near future. I appeal to you, if you have your Bible right now, to open your Bible, go with me to the book of Daniel chapter 2. And the reason I want to go to Daniel chapter 2, it's because it's one of the Bible prophecies that we are the most familiar with, and we also know it to be the most comprehensive Bible prophecy within the Holy Scriptures. And I do believe that if Daniel chapter 2 is the most comprehensive Bible prophecy within the Word of God, and it is, then we should find elements that are found within Daniel chapter 7, Daniel chapter 8, Daniel chapter 11, Daniel chapter 9, Revelation chapter 12, Revelation chapter 13, Revelation chapter 17. We should find 
elements from all of these other more detailed prophecies found right there in Daniel chapter 2. For those of you that are not familiar with Daniel chapter 2, I'm going to do a brief overview of it so that we're all up to speed so that we can walk in step as we get into the prophetic portions of this chapter. In Daniel chapter 2, it opens speaking of a king by the name of Nebuchadnezzar. Nebuchadnezzar was the leader, the ruler of the worldwide governing superpower at that time known as Babylon. We're told in Daniel chapter 2 in the first verses, the first few verses, that Nebuchadnezzar one night, he had a dream. The Word of God particularly says in the King James Version that he dreamed dreams. He had the same dream over and over again. It was repetitive. He knew there was something important about this dream, but it was so impressive, the Bible says that his sleep broke from him. So he immediately woke up out of his sleep. But as he awoke from his sleep, he could not remember the contents of his dream. But he knew there was something important about this dream that came back to him over and over again. Therefore, he called for his trusted counselors. All of you know the Chaldeans, the soothsayers, the magicians, the sorcerers, these men that were on his payroll to reveal to him hidden information. He made a decree. He asked for them to reveal to him not only the dream that he had, but also to give him an interpretation of that dream. As we are told in Daniel chapter 2, these men were not capable of doing so because the dream that Nebuchadnezzar had, it was not a normal dream. It was in a dream that came because of any other means other than God Almighty. And these men, the sorcerers, the Chaldeans, the soothsayers, magicians, these men were not servants of the living God, and therefore this information was not readily available to them. God was not giving them access to that information. In Deuteronomy 29 and 29, the Bible tells us there, the secret things belong unto the Lord thy God, but those things which are revealed belong unto us, and to our children forever, that we might do all the words of his law. The word of God makes it clear that God reveals his secret things. He gives revelations to those whose hearts are inclined to abide by his will. Matter of fact, he reveals these things unto individuals so that we might be encouraged to hasten to, hasten to obey his commandments. But these men, they were... Spiritualists, these men were pagans. These individuals had nothing to do with the true and living God, so the Lord would not reveal unto them this hidden information. And so, as you know, in Daniel chapter 2, Nebuchadnezzar sent forth a death decree for all the wise men in Babylon to be slain. And we know that at that time in Babylon, there were four Hebrew young men that had finished their training in the Babylonian scholastic system, and we know them to be Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, their Babylonian names, Belshazzar, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. They had finished their training, and they were now wise men, so that means that their heads were on the chopping block as well. So Ariok, the captain of the king's guard, was going through the kingdom, fulfilling the king's command, and when he came to God's faithful servants, Daniel required, or rather, rather Daniel inquired of Ariok, why has this decree gone forth so hastily from the king? Ariok told him the events that transpired earlier that day, and then Daniel requested that he would receive time, and if he received time, he would not only be able to reveal unto King, Nebu be able to reveal unto king Nebuchadnezzar the dream that he had, but also give him an interpretation of it. His request was granted. Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, they went and they prayed, and as God is always faithful to his promises, he revealed unto his servants the dream and the interpretation of that dream that Nebuchadnezzar had. So I want you to go with me to Daniel chapter 2, beginning at verse 31, because there the Bible gives us the account of Daniel relaying to Nebuchadnezzar the dream that he had, and then he goes forward to give him the prophetic interpretation. In Daniel 2 and verse 31, the Bible tells us that Daniel said to King Nebuchadnezzar, Thou, O king, sawest and beheld a great image. This great image, whose brightness was excellent, stood before thee, and the form thereof was terrible. The image's head was of fine gold. His breast and arms were of silver, his belly and thighs of brass, his legs of iron, and his feet part of iron and part of clay. Thou sawest till that a stone, which was cut out without hands, smote the image in its feet, which were of iron and clay, and brake them in pieces. Then was the iron the clay, the brass, the silver, and the gold broken to pieces together and became as the chaff of the summer threshing floor. And the wind carried them away so that there was no place found for them anymore. And the stone which smote the image became a great mountain and filled the whole earth. This is the dream 
and we will show the interpretation thereof before the king. All of you here that are with me right now, I know are familiar with this dream. Some of you that are watching right now are not. Nebuchadnezzar saw an image. It's clearly outlined what he saw. An image that had a head of gold, breast and arms made of silver, belly and thighs of brass, legs composed of iron, and feet composed of two different elements, iron and clay. Daniel begins to break down this symbolism. I want you to look with me in Daniel chapter 2. And I believe that we're going to begin at verse 37. Let me open my Bible here to make sure that I'm starting you off at the right point. That's correct. And verse 37... And he starts to give Nebuchadnezzar an understanding of what this image was all about. He said, Thou, O king, art a king of kings, for the God of heaven hath given thee a kingdom and power and strength and glory. And wheresoever the children of men dwell, the beasts of the field and the fowls of the heaven, hath he given into thine hand and hath made thee ruler over them all. Thou art this head of gold. And after thee shall arise another kingdom that is inferior to thee, and a third kingdom of brass, which shall bear rule over all the earth. If you look at Daniel chapter 2, verses 37, 38, 39, and 40, it becomes very evident that all of the metals that make up this prophetic image, they're all symbolic of kingdoms. In more contemporary language, we, we would say civil powers or political powers, stately powers. We're told that the head of gold symbolizes Nebuchadnezzar's kingdom, that being Babylon. After him would arise another kingdom that's inferior to him, the same way that silver is inferior in nature and also in value to gold, and then a third kingdom of brass. So we have the starting point, the head of gold, fine. We know that to be Babylon. So now we want to go to what is this kingdom that is composed of silver that makes up the breast and the arms? This would be the nation that began to rule after Babylon. Now the Bible is very clear on this issue if you go to the book of Daniel chapter 5. If you begin at verse 25, because in Daniel chapter 5, beginning at verse 25, Nebuchadnezzar's grandson was having a party in Babylon, just completely caught up in a drunken revelry. And in the midst of his folly, the Bible tells us that there was a hand that was not connected to any form that began to write on the wall. And as that hand was writing on the wall in caricatures that he could not decipher, nor anyone else that was with him in that party, everyone was terrified. The word of God tells us that the king was so terrified that his loins were loosed. Because they could not interpret the handwriting on the wall, they called for Daniel once again. Daniel comes in, and in Daniel chapter 5, beginning at verse 25, he begins to give them, as well as ourselves, vicariously an understanding of what the handwriting on the wall was. The Bible says that Daniel said there, this is the writing that was written, many, many, take you farson. This is the interpretation of the thing, many. Thy kingdom is numbered and finished. Takel, thou art weighed in the balance and find wanting. Perez, thy kingdom is divided and given to the Medes and the Persians. So we know that the breast and arms of silver are nothing more than a prophetic symbol of the kingdom of the Medes and the Persians that were responsible for the overthrow of Babylon. This takes us now down to the belly and thighs of brass. And please don't despise these things that I'm talking about. I know that many of you are familiar with this, but we have to look at these truths. Why? Because the Bible told us in 2 Peter 1 and verse 12, I will not be negligent to put you always in remembrance of these things, though you already know them. Why? This is the means by which we can be established in the present truth. So we're down to the belly and thighs composed of brass. If you go to the book of Daniel chapter 8, Daniel receives a vision. In this vision, Daniel sees some interesting creatures. First, he sees a ram. It has two horns. One is higher than the other. The ram is pushing in several directions of the compass. It seems as though nothing can stand before this creature. Then all of a sudden, the word of God tells us that a rough he-goat comes moving rapidly upon the face of planet Earth, so rapidly that its feet does not touch the ground, or its feet do not touch the ground. It moves on that ram with choler, great warlike passion, and it smites the ram. It begins to stamp upon the ram. By the way, there's a, there's a one note, there is one notable horn that is located on the forehead of this goat. And in the process of stamping out the ram, the Bible tells us that that one notable horn breaks and then four other horns, horns rather, come up in its place. Now, if you look at Daniel 
chapter 8, beginning at verse 20, the Bible gives us an understanding of what these creatures were symbolic of. In Daniel 8 and verse 20, the Bible tells us there, the ram which thou sawest having two horns are the kings of Media and Persia. So we know that that ram stands as a symbol of the kingdom that is symbolized by the breast and arms of silver in Daniel chapter, th Daniel chapter 2, the Medes and the Persians. But then when you go forward to Daniel chapter 8 and verse 21, the Bible gives us an understanding of what that goat stands as a symbol of, and we're told that it is a symbol of the kingdom of Grisha. The Bible is telling us that in the conflict between the goat and the ram, the goat won. We know the goat is a symbol of Greece. This means that the Greeks conquered the Medes and the Persians. The Bible declared it to take place before it transpired, and history says that's exactly what unfolded in time. Which now brings us down to the legs of iron, and all of us that are familiar a little bit with world history, we all know that the kingdom that began to rule over the then known world after the Greeks, we know, was the pagan Roman Empire. I want you to look with me now at Daniel chapter 2 and verse 41 because this is really where I'm trying to thrust our attention to. In Daniel chapter 2 and verse 41, the Bible says this, And whereas thou sawest the feet and toes, part of potter's clay and part of iron, the kingdom shall be divided, but in it shall be of the strength of the iron, for as much as thou sawest the iron mixed with miry clay. So here we see a new, a new, a different element introduced into the composition of this statue. It's no longer a metal. The Bible says that potter's clay is mingled with the iron. We know that these metals are symbolic of stately powers, kingly powers, political entities. But now we have potter's clay. What can potter's clay be a symbol of according to the word of God? I want you to open your Bibles with me. Go to the book of Jeremiah chapter 18. In Jeremiah chapter 18, beginning at the sixth verse, the Bible begins to unravel this mystery concerning the potter's clay. In Jeremiah 18, once again, I'm looking at the sixth verse. The Bible says, O house of Israel, Cannot I do with you as this potter saith the Lord? Behold, as the clay is in the potter's hand, so are ye in mine hand, O house of Israel. Notice that God likens the house of Israel, which are the children of Israel, unto the clay that a potter holds in his hand. What type of clay does a potter hold in his hand? Clearly, it's potter's clay. So the Lord likens his children unto potter's clay. Even in the book of Isaiah, chapter 64 and verse 8, this same information is relayed to us. But now, instead of God declaring that the house of Israel is potter's clay, the house of Israel declares themselves to be potter's clay. Isaiah 64 and verse 8, the Bible says, And now, O Lord, thou art the father, we are the clay, and thou our potter, and we all the works of thine hands. So here God's children are saying, Lord, you are the potter, we are the clay, take us into your hands, mold us, and fashion us. This is the children of Israel, according to the word of God, potter's clay. But now, I want you to look with me in Acts chapter 7. Because in Acts, the seventh chapter, there's another title that God uses to identify the children of Israel. It's right there. Acts, the seventh chapter, we're going to begin at verse 37. Acts chapter 7, looking at verse 37. The Bible tells us this concerning Moses. In Acts chapter 7, looking at the 37th verse, the Bible says, This is that Moses which said unto the children of Israel, A prophet shall the Lord your God raise up unto you of your brethren like unto me, him shall ye hear. This is he that was in the church in the wilderness. Notice that God called the children of Israel the church. The children of Israel, God's church. And God likened those very same people that he adopted as his own, his children, his church, in the book of Jeremiah 18 and verse 6 and Isaiah 64 and verse 8, he calls them potter's clay. It's fitting symbol that we use it is a fitting symbol that God would use potter's clay for his people. I always say it because potter's clay, by definition, is a clay that is free from any dirt or sediment. It's pure. It's moldable. It's pliable. 
Anytime you introduce any other element into potter's clay, it's no longer fit for the potter's use. He has to do away with it and start all over again. So the potter's clay stands as a symbol of the church. Why is this significant to all that we're talking about and all that's getting ready to transpire in the next few days? Well, we know that Daniel chapter 2 is nothing more than a delineation of history through prophecy. Babylon, represented by the head of gold, came, fell. Media Persia, represented by the breast and arms of silver, came, fell. Greece, represented by the belly and thighs of brass, came and fell. Pagan Rome, represented by the legs of iron, came and fell. We know that there was a division that transpired prior to the fall of pagan Rome, breaking it up into ten. But then let me ask you a question. Was there a time in history when the iron mingled with the potter's clay? Was there a time in history when the pagan Roman Empire mingled with the church? The answer is yes. It's called the development of the papal Roman Empire. The Bible said back in Daniel chapter 2 and verse 41, And whereas thou sawest the feet and toes, part of potter's clay and part of iron, the kingdom shall be divided, but in it shall be of the strength of the iron, for as much as thou sawest the iron mixed with miry clay. Notice the Bible said that in this union between the potter's clay and the iron, the strength would be of the potter's clay? No, the strength would be of the iron. So when the church would enter into league with the state, the church would use the power and the authority of the state to carry out its ecclesiastical, perverted ecclesiastical designs. When the church would mingle with the state, the Christians wouldn't convert the pagans, the pagans would convert the Christians. And that's why we see within Roman Catholicism every species of paganism that is known on the face of planet Earth. When you go forward in Daniel chapter 2 and verse 41, the Bible says, For as much as thou sawest the iron mixed with miry clay. Notice how it began saying the iron mingled with potter's clay, but when you come to the conclusion of the verse, It says that the iron mingled with miry clay. The word miry, from its original definition, it means something that is fit for the garbage heap. It's dirty. It is filthy. It's corrupt. That's what happened to the church as a result of mingling with the state corruption. And that's what always happens when the church tries to enter into league with the world. The world isn't converted to Christianity. Christianity is converted to the world. In the year 313 A.D., a man by the name of Constantine the Great passed what is known as the Edict of Milan. Many of you are familiar with it. It gave relief to the Christians that were experiencing fierce persecution under the reign of Diocletian from 303 to 313. He gave relief to the Christians. Matter of fact, he was looking into the Roman Empire that was dissected at that time. Pagans were destroying Christians and the pagans were making war against the Christians because they were fearful that if Christianity went unchecked, they would take down all of their pagan edifices and Christian centers of worship would be erected in their place. And they were right. And Constantine the Great having enough foresight saw the power of Christianity and he sought to League himself with this agency that could not be stopped. So he professed to be a Christian with his lips, but his heart was far from God. And then most of us are familiar with the infamous date 321 A.D. It was in 321 A.D. that Constantine the Great passed the very first national Sunday law. He passed a decree requiring everyone to rest on the venerable day of the sun, except for those that were in the countryside that were responsible for reaping the crops, lest they lost a great opportunity to gather the 
bounties of the earth. But then as time went forward, all, even those in the countryside, were required to rest on Sunday. And then the church began to grow more and more and more and more and more and more in power. Until we come to the date 538 A.D. When the Roman Catholic Church began its iron rule for 1,260 years. Every true Bible-believing Christian that refused to pay homage to a man that sought to usurp the authority of God Almighty. They were persecuted even unto the death. You know, just a few days ago, it was just a few days ago, I had the privilege of being in Torah Palici right there where the Walden Seas were, and I went to the mountain summit where they were casted off the cliff by the Roman soldiers. And as I, as I climbed up this steep mountain, and got to this summit. And I looked over the edge of this mountain where men and women and children gave their lives for Bible truth. My heart trembled. The only thing I could say was, have mercy, Lord. Because, brothers and sisters, what these individuals went through in that hour was a crisis that transpired when the hand of God was still holding back the hands of Satan. But we as God's people are getting ready to go through a time of trouble such as never was. If men would do such evil then, what do you think the future holds for us? But somehow, because years have elapsed since 1798, since the prophetic deadly wound was inflicted on the Roman Catholic Church, removing from them the civil power to enforce their ecclesiastical edicts on humanity, somehow the minds of men have come to view the Roman Catholic Church in a completely different light than what history dictates it to be. And that is the enemy of God and all those that serve him. My friends, The reason I appeal to Daniel chapter 2 this evening is because when you look back at Daniel chapter 2 and you come to the conclusion of this prophetic dream, it's very clear all of us know it by heart, most of us at least. After Daniel reveals to Nebuchadnezzar the image that he saw, concluding with these feet that are composed of iron and clay. He sees a stone which is cut out without hands that smites the image in its feet. We know according to the book of Matthew chapter 21 beginning at verse 42 that that stone is a symbol of Jesus Christ himself because Jesus declared in Matthew chapter 21 Beginning at verse 42, did ye never read in the scriptures, the stone with the, which the builders rejected, the same has become the head of the corner? This is the Lord's doing, and it is marvelous in our eyes. No human instrumentality had anything to do with the work that Jesus accomplished when he walked amongst men and the work that he's going to accomplish in the future. That stone symbolizes the second coming of Jesus Christ overthrowing the kingdoms of this world. And when the stone smites the image, it does not hit the image in the head of gold, doesn't hit it in the breast and arms of silver, nor in the legs of iron. The Bible says the stone hits the image in the feet that are composed of iron and not just clay, but miry clay. Potter's clay, pure church. Miry, tray, miry clay, an apostate church. What is the point? 
the same situation, the same predicament that plagued God's people in the past is getting ready to resurface in the very near future. Because when Jesus comes, he will overthrow a universal system that unites these two entities, which are iron and miry clay. There will be a fusion of church and state, but the church will be in an apostate state. The church will remove itself from the foundations which, it was, delivered, which was delivered unto it by its fathers. And this is what's going to prepare the way for it to make this union with the state. Matter of fact, I want you to look with me at Daniel chapter 2 and verse 44. The word of God says there, concerning the second coming of Christ. And in the days of these kings, the God of heaven shall set up a kingdom which shall never be destroyed. And it shall not be left to other people, but it shall break in pieces and consume all these other kingdoms and shall stand forever. The Bible tells us that when Christ is going to establish his kingdom, it will be in the days of these kings, plural. Cannot be talking about Nebuchadnezzar, can't be talking about Darius, it cannot be talking about Alexander the Great, it cannot be talking about any of the Caesars because they are not in existence. The kings that the word of God is speaking of here must be directly associated with those feet that are composed of iron and of clay, and they must be ten because on any human being that has a symmetrical form, you have ten toes. That means there will be ten kings that will be in existence prior to the second coming of Jesus Christ, that will be caught up in this fusion of church and state. And I want us to look at these things because there are some things that I want us to take, a serious, to take seriously into our consideration tomorrow. And if we don't have this foundation, none of that truly will make sense in my estimation. Are there ten kings that will be in existence prior to the second coming of Jesus Christ? That is the question that must be answered, and the Bible gives us the, the answer. In the book of Revelation, chapter 17, once again, starting at verse, matter of fact, I want us to look at verse 13. Concerning this issue, this is what the Bible says. Let's begin at verse 12, it's better. It says, And the ten horns which thou sawest are ten kings which have received no kingdom as yet, but receive power as kings for one hour with the beast. These have one mind and shall give their power and strength unto the beast. And these shall make war with the lamb and the lamb shall overcome them because he is Lord of lords and king of kings. The Bible lays it out in Revelation chapter 17 that there will be a war between the lamb and ten kings. These ten kings, they have not gained a geographical area over which they will reign as of yet, but they shall receive that power and authority for one hour, and they will yield that power and authority with the beast. And the word of God says that when they have this power given into their hands, they will all have one mind. You go to the book of Philippians chapter 2, beginning at verse 2, the Bible lets us know in principle what it means for one or for many to possess one mind. In Philippians chapter 2, beginning at verse 2, the word of God says this. Fulfill ye my joy that ye be like-minded, having the same love, being of one accord, of one mind. To be of one mind means that you are united. These kingly powers, these nations will be totally in union. There will be a uniting of the nations. You know exactly where I'm going with this. There will be a united nation situation that is empowered with authority to govern over all of this world. But they will not yield that authority by themselves. They will yield it in connection with the beast and the Bible says that this system will enter into war with the lamb. That is the stone striking the ten toes. 
Same picture in Daniel chapter 2 is spoken of in different language in Revelation chapter 17. Ten kings, one lamb, ten toes, one stone. Same prophecy. The Bible tells us, though, in Revelation chapter 17 concerning the lamb, that he will overcome them because he is Lord of lords and King of kings. And those that are with him are the called and the chosen and the faithful. This prophecy is going to be fulfilled to the T. Every element of this prophecy has already come to pass. We have heard it said over and over again by many theologians, by many evangelists, by many pastors, we're living in the toenails of the image. Brothers and sisters, we are living in the toes of this image. We know exactly what's going to happen to the image. It's going to be destroyed. But the Bible says there will be a people that will stand with the Lamb. They are the called and the chosen and the faithful. The question is, will you be in that group and how to be in that group? You know that group is actually spoken of in Daniel chapter 2? Because as I stated earlier, and as you know, Daniel chapter 2 is the most comprehensive Bible prophecy found within the Holy Word of God. So there are elements of all of these very pointed prophecies found right there in Daniel chapter 2. I want you to look with me in Daniel chapter 2. You'll see something very interesting. Many of us don't take the time to look at this. In Daniel chapter 2, once again, looking at verse 44. The Bible says, In the days of these kings, the God of heaven will set up a kingdom which shall never be destroyed, listen closely, and it shall not be left to other people. So the kingdom that Christ is going to establish, it's going to be left to some people. And those people are evidently spoken of in symbol in Daniel chapter 2 because the word of God says it will not be left to other people. Well, what people is it talking about then? The people that fall with the head of gold? Evidently not. The people that fall with the breast and arms of silver, evidently not. Those people cannot be connected to that image in any sort of way. Those people are there in Daniel chapter 2, but they're not a part of that image. So where are these people found? Because the word of God says it will not be left to other people. Where are they found? I want you to look at Daniel chapter 2. In Daniel chapter 2, looking at verse 45, the Bible says this. It says, for as much as thou sawest that the stone was cut out of the mountain without hand. Do you know that's the first time in the book of Daniel, in particular in the second chapter, that we actually are given information as to where that stone is cut out of? When Daniel first relays the prophetic dream to Nebuchadnezzar, he just tells him that he sees a stone cut out without hands, but he never tells him where that stone was cut out of. But in verse 45, we are told that the stone is cut out of a mountain. What is a mountain a symbol of in the Bible? A mountain can stand as a symbol of several different things. But I want you to look at one thing that a mountain can stand as a symbol of if you go with me to the book of Zechariah chapter 8. Zechariah chapter 8. In Zechariah... The eighth chapter, looking at verse 3, the Bible says this, Thus saith the Lord, I am returned unto Zion and will dwell in the midst of Jerusalem. And Jerusalem shall be called a city of truth and the mountain of the Lord of hosts, the holy mountain. God called Jerusalem the city of truth where his people dwelled. He called it his holy mountain. In the Bible, a mountain can stand as a symbol of a kingdom. We see that clearly in Daniel chapter 2, because when the stone hits the image, it becomes a great mountain and fills the whole earth, which is a symbol of the kingdom of God established here when the earth will be made new. The Bible tells us that this stone was cut out of a mountain. When you look at that phrase cut out in the original language, it means that the stone was cut off from the mountain. See, cut off from the mountain. When I think of cut off, every time I think of that phrase cut off, the first thing that my mind turns to is the Day of Atonement. 
Let me ask you a question. Because we know the stone is a symbol of Jesus Christ, was Jesus Christ ever cut off from the mountain? Because that mountain is a symbol of God's people. The Bible tells us in Isaiah, the 53rd chapter, look with me there, Isaiah, the 53rd chapter. Isaiah, chapter 53. In Isaiah chapter 53, looking at verse 8, this is what the Bible says. He was taken from prison and from judgment, and who shall declare his generation? For he was cut off out of the land of the living. Why? For the transgression of my people was he stricken. Jesus was cut off from the land of the living when he laid down his life as the atoning sacrifice for humanity. I hope you're thinking with me right now because there's a message in Daniel chapter 2 that many of us fail to take into consideration. The stone was cut off and it wasn't cut out without, with, with, it was not cut out with hands. In other words, no human instrumentality had anything to do with this. When Jesus gave his life on Calvary's cross for our sins, he told us that he laid down his life himself. No man took it from him. And he took his life up again himself as well. That's why in Matthew chapter 21, he said, this is the Lord's doing, no man's doing, and it's marvelous in our eyes. Jesus was stricken for our sins. Something interesting back there in Matthew chapter 21 and verse 44 says, whosoever therefore shall fall on this rock, shall fall on this stone, shall be broken. But on whosoever this stone shall fall, it will grind him into powder. When you look at that word powder in the original Greek from whence it was interpreted, that word powder actually means the stone will grind you into chaff. Do you see any other place in the Bible where the stone grinds something into chaff? It's in Daniel chapter 2. What's the point here? Those who refuse to fall on the rock Christ Jesus, who gave himself for our sins, when Babylon falls, they will fall as well and be ground into powder. But it's those that fall on the rock it's those who accept the sacrifice that Jesus made for us on Calvary's cross and receive the indwelling of his presence that we might live lives of righteousness even as the one whom has called us is righteous. We will be the ones by the grace of God that are recipients of that eternal kingdom. The very stone, the very one that gave himself for us, he is getting ready to execute judgment. Everything that is going on right now points to the final culmination of the great controversy. And therefore, with every fiber in our beings, we need to be seeking the face of the Lord like we have never sought him before. And as we lay hold upon the only one who can redeem us and keep us from the power of sin, it is our responsibility to sheer this message of salvation with multitudes, multitudes that the devil is trying to cloak in deception. So it is my prayer this Sabbath that each one of us will find ourselves seeking for the old paths. As we are told in Revelation chapter 1, it's my prayer that each one of us will begin to study the prophecies once again 
like we have never studied them before. Because as we study the books of Daniel and Revelation, and we see how God worked in the past, we will understand better how God is working in the present and how God will work in the future. And moreover, we will understand the work that God is trying to accomplish in our lives. And that is what God desires most for us. May God bless you. May God keep you. And may we fall on the rock Christ Jesus and be broken. Amen. Let's pray. Father in heaven, Lord, these truths are all familiar truths. But I'm realizing more and more as the days draw close in which we expect to see Jesus coming in the clouds of glory that these so-called old Familiar truths. They are going to be the guiding lights that will keep us your people in this final crisis. Just as the angel revealed to Ellen White in her first vision, as she was looking for the Advent people in the world, and her attending angel said to her, look again, but look a little higher. And she saw a path high above this dark world leading to the great city. And she saw a light at the beginning of that path, which was the midnight cry, the more sure word of prophecy. And the angel told her that as long as God's people kept their eyes fixed on that light, their feet would be safe on the path that was leading them to Jesus. I believe the same is true for us today. If we hold fast to this message of truth, these pillars of our faith, and rehearse them, and rehearse them, And by faith seek, Lord, to grow in your grace that we will, we, will not, we will not only be intellectually established in the truth, but we will also have an experimental relationship with you so that we can be sealed. We as well will be on that path safe. Safe. As we behold the Lamb which takes away the sins of this world. Keep us close to you. And may none of us that are here in this room or that are watching in our own homes, may none of us, Lord, fail of so great a salvation. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen.